Um, good morning, uh, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome to uh, Pasa Fireside Chats, episode 18, on national scientist Emil Javier's Lifting the Bottom Half, a Rip Rise. This is the title of his uh, UP Honoris Causa Doctor of Law speech a few weeks ago. And uh, this is about uh, the dismal state of our food and agriculture in the country. So thank you very much to our distinguished guests for accepting this invitation to speak on a very important topic. We say that during the pandemic, it's important to think of how to thwart uh, the threat, but we also have to think of the economy. We have to think of how to move forward our food and agriculture, also our education uh, in the country, which is underlying uh, whatever we want to do in terms of innovations in all areas of development. So thank you very much uh, for joining us. For those who uh, want uh, more information in the PASE, this is the Philippine American Academy of Science and Engineering founded in the United States 40 years ago. It's uh, composed of over 450 PhD level scientists and engineers of Philippine descent based in the Philippines, the United States and elsewhere in the world. And uh, we share in our goals to uh, help improve science and technology in the country together with the NAST and the DOST and other organizations like the NRCE. And uh, so today we are uh, uh, um, uh, contributing speech and uh, here we have the discussion guide show you um, you know our speakers will uh, touch on any or all of these uh, the, uh, the, the the situation right now the analysis of the underlying problems and then the proposed reforms of uh, NSML reinforce social sciences, focus on culture and agriculture, consolidate farms into larger, well-managed units, reorient towards demand-driven supply chain, promote value-added food and beverage manufacturing, manage trade-offs between farming intensification and care for environment, and develop and adopt disruptive technologies that benefit small farmers. At this point, I would like to introduce my co-host, uh, Dr. Felino Ino Lansigan, Professor Emeritus of UP Los Baños, former <clears throat> Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences of UP Los hey. Baños. Liga, Liga. And a PAASA board member and chair of our committee on agri-aqua projects. Okay, so, um, I think that uh, Eno will do a great job of introducing our guest speakers, whom he knows very well. And uh, we would like uh, to uh, request our participants to uh, stay on mute uh, and allow only the speaker to be unmuted. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, President Giselle. Uh, Good morning, everyone. Good day, everyone. This is Ino Lansigan of UPLB and also of ASE. I'm pleased to introduce our uh, distinguished panel of speakers this morning's chat. Uh, of course, uh, no other than our national scientist, Dr. Emil Q. Javier, a national scientist of the National Academy of Technology, he is also former president of NAS. So former president of the University of the Philippines system. He's just been conferred the Doctor of Laws honoris causa, UP, last March 6, uh, 2021. Dr. Javier is also chair of the Coalition for Agriculture Modernization in the Philippines Incorporated, or CAM, uh, which will be presented also uh, later today. Uh, recently, he's been appointed advisor to the Philippine Coconut Authority Committee on the Coconut Development Roadmap. So Dr. Emil Javier will be our uh, distinguished speaker for this morning's chat. We also have uh, a distinguished panel of uh, discussions. Uh, this includes Dr. Yocadio Leo Sebastian, 
Dr. Sebastian is the Undersecretary and also Chief of Staff at the Office of the Secretary at the Department of Agriculture. He is also former Executive Director of the Philippine Rice Research Institute of P. Rice. He is also a UPLB graduate. Uh, is uh, Dr. Benigno Ben Pexon. Dr. Pexon is president of CAMP Incorporated. He was also founder and first president of the Biotechnology Coalition of the Philippines and also former vice president, quality assurance and chemistry division at the Unilab. Our uh, third panelist is Dr. Eupenio Dong Rasco. He is academician and chair of the NAST Agricultural Sciences Division. He is also Professor Emeritus and former Chancellor of UP Mindanao. Dr. Rasco is former Executive Director also of PIRWISE and also former Director of the Institute of Plant Breeding or IPB at UPLB. So uh, we really have uh, uh, a distinguished panel of uh, speakers for this morning. And uh, we also have uh, our invited participants in this morning chat to share us their ideas and thoughts regarding the issues besetting us as far as agriculture and food. So at this point, uh, may we call on uh, the first speaker who will introduce Camp. May we call on Dr. Ben Texon to present the camp Hello. incorporated. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Ben. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. Okay. okay. Um, minor correction. I am now President Emeritus of Camp since uh, two weeks ago. Don Rasco will take over. So with that correction, para uh, claro tayo. Anyway, uh, Dr. Concepcion invited me because of my position at camp. Uh, and uh, as you, as Dr. Lansigan mentioned, Emil is the chairman of camp. Uh, most of the ideas that uh, Emil spoke about when he received this doctor applause and which he will speak about today have been the issues that camp has been grappling with since its inception more than six years ago in 19. 2015. Uh, CAMP has religiously discussed modernization of agriculture 10 months out of every year since then. We have had about 60 meetings. Uh, Emil forgot to mention CAMP in his speech. Uh, but anyway, uh, I will, uh, maybe this is, uh, I will uh, speak about a couple of subjects of. Uh, successes we've had in the camp, and that also set a background for the discussion today. Camp came into existence because of the outrage at the failure of the government to return about 9.8 billion collected from producers of copra. That money was used to create United Coconut Planters Bank, uh, UCPB, a loan was made to UCPB to purchase a controlling share of San Miguel Corporation and to set up 14 oil mills. That money hardly affected the lives of millions of coconut farmers and workers who toiled in those farms. It only benefited a very few select individuals. At one point, the Supreme Court ruled that a certain entity was the legitimate owner of a substantial share of SMC stocks because he was not a crony and there was no existing law defining ill-gotten wealth. Uh, then Associate Justice Conchita Carpio Morales called that the biggest joke of the century, biggest joke to hit the century. Camp decided early on that the best way to retrieve the coconut levy funds was to create an enabling law. So about six of us drafted the law. Uh, Nanding Bernardo brought it up and we hand carried the draft to Senator Pillar, who was and still remains the 
chair of the Agriculture and Food Committee of the Senate. And the same deal was thoroughly discussed at the Batasan. And we were really, uh, politics is crazy. The, there was a point where the uh, person I was talking about was able to stop any discussion of the coconut levy fund in the Batasan. But last month, there's a miracle that happened. Uh, President Rodrigo Duterte issued Republic Act 11254, which creates, which uh, releases coconut levy funds worth 300 billion over 50 years. So this will be a shot in the arm for the agriculture sector. That's a major uh, victory for us. And we didn't know when it was gonna come. That was a uh, struggle which extended over 40 years. Another triumph in the agricultural sector is the inauguration of the Agricultural Extension Service. Remember more than 20 decades ago, we had the uh, BIEX, that was the Bureau of Agricultural Extension. And it was a national base to provide extension to all the farmers. But when we had a devolution to LGUs, that the extension work was now in the hands of uh, provinces and the municipal level, and it didn't do very well. Uh, the, some people who are not competent held positions for extension. So anyway, as soon as the new administration came in and they, uh, Manuel Manikinol was uh, appointed as the secretary, we met him at the private residence in Makati and we said we wanted to meet him at his office. And uh, with Emil and three other guys, we went to the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we told the uh, Secretary Pinol, we volunteered to set up a province-led agriculture and fisheries extension system, as we call it, PAPES. After several meetings, CAMP signed a memorandum of agreement with the uh, the director then of the Agricultural Training Institute, si Luz Taposok, to set up PAFES in three model provinces. But then nung nawala si Manny Pinyol, we didn't know what's gonna happen again. But when uh, Secretary Dar came in, again, we pitched the idea for agricultural extension. And he, he liked the idea. In fact, it was one of his uh, main points for uh, invigorating agriculture. And uh, last November, if I remember correctly, Leo Sebastian might correct me, he signed a special order creating a technical working group to institutionalize PAFES in the Department of Agriculture. And there is more important, there's a major, there's a budget for it now. So it's a major component of DA now. So we will have uh, agricultural, agricultural extension in the 15 regions of the country. So although CAMP has helped in two major aspects of agriculture, when we created CAMP, we knew there were so many problems in agriculture and there's just no way we could address all of them. So we zeroed in on only a few. One of them was the uh, levy funds, one is extension, one is on financing, but there's a lot more. And uh, maybe uh, both Leo and uh, Emil will say something more about them. Uh, there is so much more improvement that needs to be done. As uh, Secretary Ernie Pernia said yesterday during the fireside chat, in relation to Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam, we have fallen so far behind. So we need to get a move on. I hope this uh, introduction will help set the stage for Emma. Thanks very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pexon, for the announcement on the initiatives and efforts of CAMP in <clears throat> trying to reinvigorate agriculture in the country. 
uh, well, uh, we wish you uh, uh, successes in your initiatives and efforts working with our agricultural uh, department leaders. At this point, uh, we're happy to introduce our main speaker, uh, whose talk will be entitled Lifting the Bottom Half. No other scientist, Dr. Emil Q. Javier. Sir, you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, you know, for the introduction. But let me uh, reiterate that uh, uh, there's a mistake in in the in my description. I'm not chairman of the of the group crafting the coconut industry roadmap. I'm just uh, one of the advisors. Well, uh, as uh, explained by our energetic. President uh, Bissell uh, Concepcion. The idea uh, for a, re a reprise of my speech at the con conferment ceremony for the honorary degree for me three weeks ago was at the instance of uh, Bissell that perhaps it's appropriate that there is a follow up or segue to, to my speech. Essentially, what really should we be doing individually and, and collectively? In that uh, ceremony in the uh, Los Banos, uh, I publicly confessed that I have mixed uh, feelings about the award. Of course, uh, elation, uh, the honor of receiving the award but privately and, and deep in my heart, I know the, the award uh, rings hollow. The accomplishments I'm being cited for, uh, whatever contributions I made to the university and to agriculture, apparently did not really mean very much because uh, Philippine agriculture has been in the doldrums for easily two to three decades, which coincide with my more fruitful uh, years. And therefore, uh, uh, I have mixed feelings for receiving the award. And uh, I thought it appropriate to call out ourselves, especially the university which I graduated from, which prides itself as uh, the leading uh, institution teaching and researching and promoting agriculture, that in the end, we are really found one thing because our agriculture is uh, performing uh, miserably if we compare ourselves with our ASEAN uh, neighbors. I am reminded, like I guess many of you, of that iconic movie uh, directed by Lino Broca around 1974, Tining Bangka, uh, Tining Bang Tayo Ngunit uh, uh, Kulang. So this morning, I will essentially go over the six uh, redirections that I thought uh, UPLB had to undertake uh, internally. Uh, but I would, I elected to just focus uh, on one of the six and in the second half of my presentation, uh, cite three examples of what we can do, what can be done to really move our agriculture forward. The evidence for the lack of performance of uh, Philippine agriculture is starkly 
demonstrated in uh, our national statistics. And the most telling and the most humiliating statistics is uh, the incidence of poverty in our country. If you compare ourselves with the four other major ASEAN countries, our poverty figures are really very embarrassing. Our poverty incidence is about 26% in 2015, which was more than double of Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam, uh, and, and certainly very, very far from Malaysia. But note that that 26% is really, really brought down by the high incidence of poverty in the countryside, which is as high as 36%. The second metric that uh, tells us that we are really have so, so far to go are our agriculture and food exports. By the way, uh, I hope Rolly D is around because I got many of these numbers from his two books on agribusiness. Rolly D is our really guru in agribusiness. But anyway, in terms of exports, we exported a measly amount of 5 billion US dollars. But note that uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand have four to eight times as, mu as much more food exports than, than we did in uh, 2018. And the numbers uh, look even worse if we look at the uh, trade balance, uh, balance between food imports and exports. Again, we compare ourselves with the other four ASEAN major economies. And again, the numbers are really appalling. We have the ignominious distinction of the only ASEAN country of the five who is a net food importing country. The other four have healthy surpluses in their trade balance for food and agriculture. The message I really tried to bring across was relating the underperformance of Philippine agriculture with the institutions that have to do with advancing agriculture. And in this particular instance, I was really addressing it to UPLB. And although, of course, uh, the development of agriculture and the relation of the institutions that have, that have to do with agriculture is more complex, the reality is we cannot help but link the underperformance of agriculture with the leading Philippine institutions that have to do with agriculture, among them, UP Los Baños. Therefore, the first step has to be one of institutional contrition, meaning responsible institutions like UPLB must uh, humbly and candid, candidly accept that we have been found wanting and that we are a part of the, the problem. So if we were to turn things around, it's only incumbent upon institutions like UPLB to accept responsibility for part of the failure and resolve to move on. However, I hasten to add that uh, in the case of UPLB, it's not that we were doing the wrong things no, uh, I, I don't think it was that case. It was not so much of wrongdoing. 
but really more of omission of what we have not done enough or could have done better. Now, the message was addressed to UPLB because I, I'm from there. But I think uh, if we are going to be honest to ourselves, this could very well apply to the rest of UP, to us members of NAST, NRCP, those Department of Culture, and even uh, many of us in uh, fellow members of uh, PASE. So the message I, I tried to bring across to call out the UPLB and similar institutions is that we can do better. Not that we are a superman that we can really on our own really turn things around, but certainly we could do so much uh, to help agriculture to move forward. But I think it's important that we recognize uh, that, the, the, that the generalization that the Philippine agriculture is performing dismally is correct, but not the complete story. Because agriculture in the Philippines, like the other countries, I suppose, uh, consists of uh, two halves. On one hand, you have the uh, more than half involving uh, the agribusiness corporations, the better off farmers who are very productive and competitive and they are doing well. But there is that second half, the struggling bottom half of the world of small farmers who have limited access to technology, inputs, credits, and, and markets. I think uh, to, to some extent, uh, UPLB uh, can pat itself in the back and say that we have done well. We have done well for the top half. For example, uh, in, in our case in, in plant breeding, we now have a very vibrant uh, seed industry in the country. And practically most of the senior breeders of those seed companies uh, came from, from Los Banos. So in a way we have done well for that top half. So the, the question and the challenge is, what do we do better? What do we do more? to lift the bottom half. In my speech in, in Los Banos, uh, I noted down six issues or concerns that I thought uh, the university should take a second look to redirect uh, our uh, programs and activities. And at this point, let me uh, commend uh, Ben Pexon for calling attention uh, about camp. Because as uh, Ben mentioned, we have been meeting and meeting in camp for the past six years. And these are the precisely the things that have come across time and time again. But in my speech, I thought I would not side camp because that would sound like uh, lifting my own uh, bench. But really, these are the six uh, redirections that uh, we, get, we got to uh, do in agriculture to move our agriculture forward, to make it more productive, more competitive, and very, and most importantly, to help the bottom half of our uh, sector. So I will go over the six uh, major redirections uh, very broadly, and I hope uh, our panelists would 
take on some of them as well as our listeners. But in the second half of my presentation, I will just focus on one, the elaboration of schemes to consolidate small farms. And, and the shy three possible examples of what can really be done to move agriculture. The choice of word redirection is quite uh, deliberate because as I, I said earlier, uh, the problem in the case of LB and, and most of our institutions is not so much of wrongdoing. Uh, the wrongdoing is on the part of uh, as scrupulous politicians and, and they're ill, but not really as uh, scientists and, and academics. So redirection meaning what we are doing now are not necessarily wrong, but we should exert and direct more efforts in those other things that we are not doing well enough or we are not doing, doing enough. So uh, at this point, let me uh, uh, broadly uh, go, go over these six the directions, which was uh, uh, directed to UPLB, but could very well be directed to the uh, whole uh, academic and science com community. The first one is reinforcing the social sciences. Uh, this was uh, prompted uh, by the observation of many, not just myself, that most of our problems in agriculture really has less to do with the agriculture part, but more of the culture dimensions. The social factors, economic factors, uh, political factors, social conflict and, and governance. Unfortunately, uh, uh, this is uh, a reflection of the history of uh, UP Los Baños, because Los Baños from the very beginning was known for the natural sciences and the practical arts and not so much on, on the social uh, sciences. And I recall uh, 40 years ago when I became the second chancellor of Los Baños, the late national scientist Helia Castillo uh, wrote an article with the title UPLB social scientists, second class citizens in a first class university. As a subtle reminder from Helia, that as the new chancellor of Los Baños, that was one of my obligations. Unfortunately, we have not really gone very far. And I think uh, it's timely that we really put more effort in the social sciences in, in the academia at least in UP Los Baños. The, the second redirection is uh, my observation, and I guess for many of us, that really most of the constraints, not all, but many of the constraints that we have in agriculture has to do with or associated with small fragmented land holdings. Uh, which constitute the bulk of our agriculture. And therefore, uh, it's incumbent on us to, to elaborate on the various modalities of consolidating and clustering our small farms into larger, more economical uh, units. The third new direction has to do with the uh, increasing emphasis on, on the markets, as well as uh, planning for the supply chains and, and programs. Again, this is a part of the history of Los Baños. Los Baños always had been known for our uh, competence in the development of uh, component technologies, but not so much of systems much less uh, supply chains uh, or going all the way to, to uh, markets and exports. 
The fourth direction has to do with the value adding and food and beverage manufacturing. Again, this is reflective of uh, the history of Los Banos and maybe the whole of the Department of Agriculture as well. Uh, most of our efforts have been uh, in primary production, the prim in primary agriculture, which constitutes uh, uh, about 8% of our GDP. And we tend to gloss over the bigger elephant in the room, which is uh, food and beverage manufacturing, which together account for 27% including the logistics, 27% of our GDP. Uh, this is where we have not done as well. If you look at uh, supermarkets uh, uh, in the US, you find all these products from, from Thailand in uh, food and, and beverage. And how well they have done in, uh, in uh, processing, packaging, uh, marketing, and, and promotion. It's not that we didn't have our own food science uh, uh, department at UPLD. We had that very, very early on. But we have, I guess we have not done enough, including uh, post-harvest. So we have done some, but we should be doing more in value adding, food processing, and uh, manufacturing. The fifth consideration is the increasing stress on the environment by intensification of farming. This is particularly true for us because our land people ratio is quite narrow. We have only so many hectares or square meters of farmland for every Filipino and that's, that number is getting smaller and smaller. So we have no choice but to further intensify farming. And inevitably, that intensification of farming will uh, put increasing pressure on biodiversity, on uh, water resources, usage and pollution, as well as uh, soil, uh, soil losses and uh, particularly soil erosion. And finally, uh, precision agriculture and all these new disrupting technologies. Uh, we have genomics, uh, robots now, drones, all kinds of sensors, uh, analytics, big data analytics, bioinformatics, and now uh, the internet of things, uh, digitalization and so forth and so on. Our young people are in, into this, and rightfully so, because uh, we have to master these technologies ourselves and uh, develop our own uh, to advance our national purposes. But as uh, technologies uh, go, there are going to be winners and losers. And if we don't watch out, this would even why then the chasm between the tough half of our agriculture with the bottom half. So we should embrace these uh, new disrupting technologies, but always on the lookout on those things which are more or less scale neutral and uh, those that will alleviate the constraints and conditions that small farmers uh, find themselves in. Uh, and uh, in my message, I, I called out one such example of how uh, young people now are putting together uh, platforms uh, that enable farmers to link themselves directly with the supermarkets, with, with the customers, uh, platforms that allow the banks to more readily extend loans for financial inclusion with the small farmers. And I got word from Tito Aliga just this morning that he invited one or two of such uh, uh, young people who are doing precisely uh, these things. So 
So to the rest of uh, my my presentation, I will just I said uh, just focus on number two because I am persuaded that uh, among the many things that we need to do in agriculture to make our agriculture more productive, competitive, but more most importantly help the poorer ones, uh, meaning lifting the bottom half, is to address the constraints that go with small fragmented uh, land holdings. Uh, of course, uh, smallness is not an absolute impediment because uh, other countries around us, particularly North Asia, Japan, China, Taiwan, South Korea, also have small farms and yet they're able to uh, move forward. And that's mainly because they're able to have the social organization to, to organize the, the farmers, producers into cooperatives or associations. And uh, adapt new business modalities and link them to the supply chains and to the markets. So uh, the matter of, of organizing or going around the constraints uh, to smallness and fragmentation, I am proceeding from the, the premise that although the most obvious and most direct solution is lifting the limits to land holdings, imposed by agrarian reform. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, it's uh, very contentious politically and, and divisive. And uh, only a president with huge uh, political capital would dare at, uh, reverse agrarian reform. So we have to live with that, but look at other things of how we can get around smallness of our farms. And the most obvious is the organization of our small farmers into larger units as cooperatives and of course irrigators associations and agrarian reform beneficiaries organization in which we have invested a lot of effort in the past. Unfortunately, uh, there are a few very successful ones but majority are not doing as well. Uh, we cannot give up on, on those farmers' organization. We have to persevere and, and do better. The other modality that I am citing is the adoption of the one town, one product approach, uh, which uh, the, the Department of Trade Industry is pushing, which ironically our own Department of Agriculture is not mentioning at all is the idea of focusing or concentrating uh, production in those areas which are agroecologically suitable and where markets can, can be arranged. Uh, the auto approach is not an original of uh, DTI nor uh, President GMA during her time. This was really uh, started by a, a uh, in Japan and then adapted in Taiwan and then we pick it up. But we should go back to that because that's a, a very neat formula of attaining a scale uh, by persuading the LGUs to work together with farmers and co-ops and concentrate on certain commodities where they have comparative advantage and linking them with the processors, uh, exporters, and marketers. The third modality is by contract growing arrangements. Again, this is you, you, you're able to manage uh, the small farms into large plan and manage them as large units by way of uh, contracts uh, with uh, integrators who in most arrangements will supply the planting materials or breeding stock, the fertilizers, the feed stuff, the extension and uh, plant and animal health, health services, and as well as for uh, post-harvest processing, 
and at the end, assure the farmer operators of a fair price, very importantly, a fair price and being paid on time. In fact, uh, I think most of the success of, uh, of Thailand has to do with these uh, different modes of contract drawing between the producers and the uh, large agribusiness uh, corporations in, in, uh, in Thailand. And of course, uh, the, the easiest and most straightforward of uh, consolidation is by farm leasing. Uh, this is the simplest, but uh, and other in in some cases uh, the farmers will take it at the best choice. But by and large, straight farm leasing is often the least profitable arrangement to farmer uh, owners. So in the final minutes of my presentation, allow me to give three examples of uh, what we can do better. I think uh, we should uh, spare ourselves on the usual uh, uh, approach of plugging ourselves of how badly we are doing and who to blame and, and so forth and so on. But we fall short of what, what do we do? What can we do together? So in the last few minutes, I'll, I'll give three examples. And there are many more because I know some our panelists know, are aware of many other ways of doing, of doing uh, things. So for my purposes, I will just uh, elaborate on three discrete examples of what we can do as far as going around the constraints of smallness and fragmentation of our lands. I will cite the potential of the 4,000 4, plus irrigators associations, which we have been, which we have organized uh, through the National Irrigation Administration. And the uh, second is uh, the appeal and challenge to agribusiness, supermarkets, and captains of industry to inject life into our co-ops, IAs, and agrarian reform beneficiaries. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the development and promotion of co-ops is with government. Unfortunately, most of the efforts have been more of regulation rather than business promotion. And I guess uh, the, the people who knows uh, business development and promotion best uh, the guys from the private sector. And so, and uh, as contract growers and as uh, corporate social responsibility projects, uh, our uh, agribusiness sector and the captains of industry can really do a lot uh, to help our uh, farmers organize, better organize in co-ops irrigators associations and the agrarian farm beneficiaries. And thirdly, our favorite in camp, how to help move a, a coconut, is the idea of a, a strategy of concentrating uh, production of coffee under coconuts in certain uh, municipalities. Uh, to take advantage of the agronomic potential of having crops and even livestock uh, under coconuts to increase total productivity and income of the farmers. And in this case, uh, in this case, uh, coffee. So the first example is uh, the uh, the 4,000 plus irrigators associations that have been established by the National Irrigation Administration or the NIA. I'm calling attention to this because we have out of our 3 million hectares of irrigable land, 
We have invested so far in the development of about 1.8 million hectares. By my estimate, since the last 50 years, we must have invested maybe 800 to 900 million pesos. Uh, and it should be more by now in developing the 1.8 million hectares of irrigated land. But people are glossing over the fact that the cropping intensity, the recorded cropping intensity of those irrigated lands is a initially 1.37 compared with the ideal or target of two. You're irrigating precisely, you will have a second crop after the rainy season. But we are not realizing that. We are realizing only 0.37. So the immediate huge challenge is how do you recover the lost productivity from the missing hectares because you are able to attain a cropping intensity of 1.37 instead of two. My, my fellow agronomists will, will recognize this uh, readily. So what I'm saying is, if we manage our irrigation systems better, and it can, it cannot, they cannot be managed well without the cooperation of the water users themselves or the irrigators association. The idea is we could recover the productivity of 1.26 million hectares of prime lands if we can organize the irrigators association in, in the managing the irrigation system. And that's important, if you have water, irrigation water, then you could diversify uh, into other high value crops between and after rice. Now, I'm calling out Nia because Irrigation management transfer is their corporate strategy because all over the world, irrigation systems cannot be run efficiently without the cooperation of the water users themselves. And correctly, Mia's corporate strategy is to transfer management of the downstream activities of irrigation system to the users. But, uh, you know, the budget of Mia is 30 billion every year but their support for irrigation management transfer is only 100 million. I think this is something you, know, you could fill in the blanks and see the opportunity. Nia has the money, but maybe Nia does not have the personnel uh, to organize uh, the irrigators associations and make them effective businesses. So, but I'll leave it at that, but uh, call the attention to this uh, huge potential of improving the, the life of many Filipinos uh, now tilling those 1.8 million hectares of prime lands. The second uh, discrete example that I, I will take on is uh, how better we could improve the organization and, and businesses of the farmer co-ops, irrigators associations, and the agrarian reform beneficiaries organizations. So we have made an extra effort in organizing our farmers into co-ops, IAs, and ARBOs. But unfortunately, except for a few outstanding co-ops or IAs and ARBOs, for the most part, they are not doing well. So what do we do differently? And how could we do it better? I think we have uh, the answer right before us because I have come across so many successful co-ops and projects assisted by, assisted by big business to the Philippine Business for Social Progress or PBSP. The corporations are contributing 
to PBSP, but I think we could scale it up dramatically, uh, both as a as corporate social responsibility projects for those uh, who are not engaged in agriculture, for those corporations not in agriculture, but for those which are engaged in agriculture, incorporate uh, contract growing, for example, into their business uh, strategy. Uh, I think uh, this is now being done by some, uh, at least in uh, pineapple, banana, papaya, we have uh, contract growing, including tobacco. But we could do more. And so we have to appeal to uh, our agribusiness and captains of industry to help. For example, uh, Ramon Ang just pledged one or two billion to dredge the Tulhanan River. Good example of corporate social responsibility. Imagine if San Miguel could now take on the responsibility of making good businesses out of those <coughs> uh, 4,000 irrigators association with all its business management acumen. You know, that, those examples are tantalizing. But here, uh, from the point of view of uh, in terms of credit, this one could also address the problems we have in the agri agra law where the, the banks find it uh, difficult and risky to lend to small farmers. And uh, they would rather pay fines uh, rather than, than lend. So if now these uh, co-ops, irrigators, associations, and ARBOs are engaged in contract growing or under the tutelage of the private sector, then it will be easier for the banks and consider it less risky to extend loans. But this would require that the Banco Central should qualify lending to corporations engaged in helping out co-ops, irrigators association and, and farmers groups as compliant with agri agri So with that, I'm uh, leaving it to you uh, especially to the panelists to, to take on those things which I have. Uh... Oh, sorry, there's another one I forgot. <laughs> and that's what they, that's our favorite income. You know, <clears throat> uh, coconuts, uh, coconut farmers uh, are, have not been doing well all these years. The pr primary productivity of coconut is low, and uh, the the market. We are the coconut oil is a, a minority player in the world vegetable oil market. But there are ways of improving our competitiveness and, and the income of farmers. And one of them is by intercropping because there's so much sunlight filtering in under the, between the canopy of coconuts that can support crops, forages, and, and livestock. But out of the 3.5 million hectares of coconut, the, the figure showed that easily 2 million hectares of coconut are not effectively intercropped. But coffee grows very well under coconut because coffee needs partial shade and partial protection from strong winds, strong winds which the coconut can provide. Now, if we take coffee, uh, we consume about 130,000 metric tons of green coffee beans a year, roughly in that number. And I'm, I'm I, I, the numbers I see is that easily 100,000 met, metric tons of green coffee beans that we consume are really imports. And there's no reason why we should keep on importing those beans because we can grow those beans uh, ourselves. <laughs> so the idea is to uh, persuade the LGUs working with the farmers to adapt in the coconut growing areas to con uh, adapt coconut coffee intercropping as their auto project. 
there's no shortage of coconut lands suitable for coffee all over the country. But it will be a mistake if you're going to grow coffee all over the year, all over the country. We, we have to concentrate our production to achieve economies of scale. And by my estimation, if you grow a coffee under coconut, you could easily get, with, with the good management, uh, 0.75 tons of green coffee beans per hectare per year. And so if the idea simply as a first ambition to substitute for the 100,000 metric tons of green copper beans, which we import, then our efforts could very well be concentrated only in 133 towns, each with 1,000 hectares. I have been in touch with Nestle, with uh, Art Maria of Nestle, and they said, oh, we can easily identify 100 such towns which are now growing coffee and which Nestle had been helping all these years. So it's a matter of scaling up so they will uh, grow 1,000 hectares instead of 50 to 100 hectares of coffee. Of course, um, this would require the active support of the private sector, and we have a very active coffee board led by Chit Juan. Uh, so we have to make market arrangements with Nestle, Robina, Commonwealth, Rastans, Figaro, and all those uh, companies which uh, purchase uh, the green beans. Of course, this does not mean that we will forget the, the potential of other small business and entrepreneurs to go into uh, coffee uh, coffee processing. So this is a call out to PCA, the high value, value, high value crops program of DA, the SUCs like uh, Habita State, Benguet State, Visca, USM, as well as uh, Land Bank and the Philippine Deposit Insurance Corporation for their credit requirement. So thank you very much and uh, a pleasant morning to all of us, and I hope we'll have a spirited discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, National Scientist Javier, uh, for the reprise of your message on lifting the bottom half, which focuses on the underperformance of agriculture and food industry in the Philippines. Dr. Javier noted and also elaborated on uh, six reforms, or he called red directions, to move agriculture forward. In his message, uh, he also indicated that this message is probably an institutional contrition addressed to UPLB as an institution and also perhaps to uh, the Department of Agriculture and those in the agriculture sector. So we are happy to uh, have invited two distinguished speakers who are both UPLB alumni and also both working or who have been executive director of Bill Rice and one of them with uh, now leading the Department of Agriculture. Uh, may we call on Dr. Leo Sebastian, Undersecretary and Chief of Staff of the DA Secretary, Department of Agriculture uh, for his comments. Thank you, you know, thank you, um, Giselle. And of course, thank you, Dr. And Javier, Dr. EQJ. And before I before I start, I would like just like to acknowledge on a personal note that uh, in 2008, when I left the Philippines, I left Pil Rice. I was actually encouraged by Dr. EQJ, so he encouraged me to take that opportunity to go out, learn, gain experience. And of course, earn some money. Because you know, if you work in the government, we have at that time we have an unexplained poverty. <laughs> we have if you, if you work, if you just if you just work honestly in the government, you will have an unexplained poverty. So he advised me to uh, get out, learn, gain experience. So I came back last year, hoping that I can uh, contribute. And now uh, apply what I have learned from other countries. I was uh, 
for 11 years going around Asia, except Philippines. I was based in Malaysia and then Vietnam. I was for six years in Vietnam. And all those years, they were wondering why I was helping those countries and not uh, should be working in the Philippines because they, the, the, our Asian neighbors have very high regard to Filipino scientists and Filipino development workers. And in Vietnam, for example, they were asking me why I was helping them increase their rice production. But I was only telling them, I'm helping you because I want to make sure that we in the Philippines will have enough rice to import. So that was just how I, I tried to appease myself and also to placate them. Maybe. <laughs> so, when I first enrolled in UPLB, this is how uh, inspiring Dr. Emil Javier is. When I first enrolled in UPLB in 1979, the chancellor was then Dr. Emil Javier. He was a very young chancellor and we meet him very often in the dormitory at night. He will go around after coming from the UST, all his work. And he will engage the students, even the student leaders from, from left to right in discussions. So I, I was also an agriculture and rural development scholar or an art scholar, like the current chancellor, Dr. Don Camacho. Most of us, most of the art scholars came from the bottom half. Many of the arts grantees have uplifted their parents and their families from that bottom half. Many have gone abroad, although most of us are still in the Philippines, just above the bottom half. To this, I would say education is the best way to uplift the plight of that bottom half. This is also the reason why I consider as anti-poor and discriminatory the call of many groups to encourage farmers' children to continue farming. I do not agree with that. I believe it should be the children of the rich who should be encouraged to go into farming. They can go into farming with their capital to modernize and commercialize Philippine agriculture. Just like what our national scientist was saying, we should tap the top modern hub rather than uh, as the bottom half to continue their uh, profession of farming. I fully agree with the six points raised by our national scientist, Dr. Emil Javier. Indeed, these are areas that UPLB and other agriculture, state colleges and universities and the department should prioritize focusing on. I view these areas as areas we urgently need to strengthen, to be more successful in implementing our agriculture programs, uplift our farmers' condition, and industrialize our agriculture sector. We need to build our capacity to educate Filipino students in these areas and capacitate them to address the six points. Let me explain why I support these six points. I have always thought that we need more investment in R&D. Indeed, we have seen studies after studies how we have underinvested in R&D. We need to create more innovations. I believe that before I left the Philippines in 2008, I still believe it, but it has changed significantly. I now think that it is not only the lack of R&D innovation that we are falling behind, we have failed miserably in scaling many of our innovations to benefit our farmers and our agriculture sector. I think that is one of our big failing. And I think Dr. Javier has also uh, elaborated on it a lot of ways. But I would like to explain my, my, my point. We have many good innovations, but many of these innovations have not reached scale beyond a few hundred farmers or a few thousand hectares. I have seen, for example, many of our innovations being scaled in millions of hectares in Vietnam or millions of hectares in Malaysia or in, in, in Thailand. But in the Philippines, we can only reach a few hundred farmers or a few thousand hectares. We fail because of any of the following. We fail to understand the actual farmers' needs. We assume that they need what we have developed. 
We have scientists who are very proud of what they have accomplished, but they fail to relate with the, with the needs of the farmers. We always assume that what we are doing, our farmers will need. And we tend to dictate what we want, uh, what, we, what we think should, what we think that our farmers need. We fail to develop the knowledge, skills, and processes that will scale the innovation. This is something to do with management and our technology-based approach. We think that scaling is doing one model multiplied X times. So you go from, you have one village, another village, 10 villages, 12 villages, rather than grow one growing X times. So we fail to look at the, the management of many villages together. We, we tend to look, we, we want a superman to do the multiplication or scaling. We fail to understand the need the needed logistics and supply chain to scale the innovation. We want to do it ourselves rather than many partners and players. And I think this is what Dr. Abir has also emphasized as the system, system approach. Or sometimes we don't have the budget to do it, just like what is happening in NIA. And part, we fail because skeptics and envious colleagues around us. So in the university, we have that kind of competition where a lot of colleagues will discourage you when you, when you, when you try to scale. Or the scientist will keep his uh, innovation to himself and keep it till uh, wherever. I have observed our neighboring countries while working in the Asian region. And I have seen how many of our innovations have benefited farmers and the agriculture sector in Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam. I have seen many examples to conclude that if only we have scaled it in the Philippines, our farmers would have benefited from it and the, agri and the Philippine agriculture would have been different. Hence, I fully support that the university and the Department of Agriculture focus on building knowledge and capacity on points one, two, three, four, and five. I would like to show at this time a slide, to share a slide about the Department of Agriculture. This is currently what the strategy that we are doing and called the 1DA agenda key strategies, transforming the Philippine agriculture. So as you can see, Many of the things that Dr. Abier, because Dr. Abier is also the chair of the Secretary's Advisory Group or SAGE. So we, we have adapted a lot of the suggestions of Dr. Abier. And we have, we have emphasized, we are now focusing, for example, on Bayanihan Agri or clustering consolidation, province led agriculture and fisheries extension system. And these strategies are grouped into consolidation, modernization, industrialization, and professionalization. The DA program on improving productivity, farm clustering, and consolidation, enhancing food logistics and supply chain, just to name a few. But in all this implementing these strategies, what we urgently need is capacity to attain scale for many of these, of these strategies implemented at the ground level. That is the part where we really need, we have this good agenda, good strategies, good framing, but the challenge now is how do we attain scale? And that is where I'm drawing from a lot of my experiences outside and trying to, trying to do what we can do to operationalize because for me, the challenge <laughs> that in the framing or in that the listing of the agenda or even formulating the plan, it is operationalizing the plan. That I think is where we are always weak, where we have failed in the past. We urgently need the capacity to attain scale and to teach and inform a greater number of farmers, fishers about the technical, economic aspects of their vocation. What we wish to see are more organized group of farmers and fishers 
platform who are both technology and market driven, who have the capability to efficiently produce the right quality and amount of farm and fishery commodities that the market demands. On number six of Dr. Javier's uh, points, this point reinforces the need for a robust social science orientation among our scientists. We need to build the last mile between, the, between our advanced innovation and our farmers. The technology divide is dividing, is widening. We have to understand that our farmers are also humans like us. They think like us, open behave like us, and like us, they also have many aspirations and priorities beyond agriculture. Many of our innovations are not only challenging to scale, many of them are also in forms not suitable for farmers or our local technicians to apply. Here I would like to cite an example. When I was in Vietnam, I was looking at the project NOAA. I don't, I, maybe you're familiar with the project NOAA. This was funded by DUST. In the project NOAA, they have developed digitized maps, risk maps, typhoons, earthquakes, landslides, etc., flooding. I was looking at that at those maps in the Philippines that was developed way back in 2015, 2014. And I can only see, I can only I can only imagine how useful this would be for agriculture. But I was in Vietnam and I was wondering if somebody was doing that for agriculture. But in Vietnam, I have the challenge of dealing, of helping the government cope with El Nino in 2016, 2015, 2016. So I was looking if the, if the Vietnamese government can also do something similar like that. But while, while going around, the problem was not the, tech, the technology, the high-tech technology, because ERI has already developed a lot of these maps, risk maps, salinity maps, and a lot of technology recommendations. But while going around in the Mekong Delta, what I, what, I, what I observe is that the technicians are not applying them or are not adapting them, and the farmers are not adapting them. Here, here have developed salt tolerant varieties, but the, the farmers are not planting. Iri has recommended uh, early planting, but nobody was following. So what I did was to look at the link between those high, high technology and the farmer's need and link them the last mile. So we need to have those, thing, those activities. How do you link those high-tech innovations to the, to the actual application in the field? But very often, we neglect that because the researcher will just say, that is the job of the extension worker. That is the job of the local government units. That is the job of the Department of Agriculture. But if you don't, if you don't, if you don't build the ownership of that output so that it can be carried to the farmers, it will not, it will not just, uh, it will not just go down or trickle down. It is about time that farmers are recognized as important private sector players in agriculture who should be capacitated in terms of better access to support and assistance they need. Like what Dr. Rabir is saying, technology, inputs, credit, and marketing. And the technology that we now have can help them access this, uh, these things. Lastly, I would like to add another point to the six points of EQJ. I want to add the need to strengthen policy research in universities by building up the expertise on data analytics. We are very weak in data analytics. I was surprised when I was in Vietnam that despite what you may say, you may not trust their data, but they have data up to the lowest level because of their communist setup. They gather information. So if you need information, they know the fertility of the soil up to the village level or up to the field level. We don't have, our data analytics is very poor. 
and our and our ability to use this data analytics for policy is also very weak. The DA badly needs in-depth, short-term, and long-term analysis of the different policies affecting agriculture. So you can see, with the pandemic, we have recognized in the department that we have to shift a lot of our policies. But we need a lot of support from the academe and from our scientists in analyzing these policy shifts. The DA badly needs this kind of support. I have observed how policies pertaining to investments, regulations, and incentives have been effectively used by Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam to develop their agriculture. In the Philippines, we are always depending on the department for budgets like subsidies and dole outs. But in other countries, they are looking at their Department of Agriculture for changes in, in investment regulations and incentives. That is their focus. Even in, even in Vietnam, I did not see so much ex subsidies for farmers. Instead, there were a lot of changes or review of their policies so that investments could come in. I think we have to look at, we have to invest also on this area of policy research. Agricultural modernization in these countries have been driven by demand or market because they have put up the policies that opened up their agriculture to investment. As the as Philippine agriculture moves from one current state to modernize competitive agriculture, we also need our universities to strengthen their capacity to do policy research, which I think was also, which I think was also a strength of UPLB in the 70s and 80s. We need to learn and do better on how UPLB influenced our agriculture development in those years. I think in the 70s and 80s, UPLB influenced our agricultural development very well. I was still a young student then, but we can see how active UPLB was engaged at the national level. In other, ti in, in other times, as in, as in other times, we again have a chance, no matter how short it is, to help set Philippine agriculture direction. We have a secretary who is an agriculturist, supported by many agriculture graduates. Let's take advantage of this opportunity in making some dent in setting the medium to long-term Philippine agriculture direction. Let's do our share in nation building through tangible actions. Let's involve ourselves even more deeply in the process of progress. Our knowledge and expertise are very relevant and critical in the context of the immense challenge, challenges facing Philippine agriculture today. The opportunity for UPLB and our agriculture sector to reclaim their, to, to, to reclaim their place in the history of our country should not be missed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Yusek Leo. Thank you for your comments on the six reform directions needed to move our agriculture forward. And also thank you for sharing the DA1, DA agenda to transform Philippine agriculture. Uh, but before we go to uh, uh, the open forum, let me first call our next panelist uh, in the person of academician Dong Rascal. Take it away, sir.
Okay, I'm having problems with the uh, uh, screen sharing. Let me uh, try it again. It's not working. Um, uh -huh. um, did you enter the full screen? No, we see it, Dong. Now we see it. Please um, enter the full screen. Click on um, share screen. Uh, and then enter the full share. rather than. Click full screen, enter full screen. Okay. Oh, gee, it's not working. I practiced it before and it was working and now it's not working. Please email, please email me if you can, uh, the PowerPoint slide and I will try to be the one to share it. But you can start now. Uh, okay. I'll try one last time and then uh, if that doesn't work, then I'll uh, do as you suggested. Okay, I hope, I hope you can see this. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay. Go ahead, please. Well, well uh, first, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lansigan, for uh, the introduction. Uh, just a minor correction. Uh, I have not been uh, chancellor of UP Mindanao, uh, the job of chancellor is beyond my pay grade. I'd be happy to be referred to as uh, Professor Emeritus with uh, uh, a much lesser pay grade with a take home pay <laughs> of zero. Uh, uh, the problem of uh, lifting the bottom half is an old problem referring to the plight of poor farmers. Like national uh, scientists Javier and many of us in the field of agricultural development, I have been looking uh, for solutions. But it seems that all the solutions tried so far only succeeded in uh, burying the farmers deeper and deeper into the poverty hole. Now I believe uh, it is because we have been looking at the problem only through the lens of production. Because of this limitation, uh, the usual solution is to increase yield and reduce production cost. In the current dispensation, it is summed up in three words, ani at kita. This has not worked in the past and it will not work today unless it involves uh, a restructuring of agriculture, which I will explain uh, later. Uh, we need to have a different approach to solving the problem. Two years ago, uh, we at the National Academy of Science and Technology believe 
uh, that this alternative approach must start with the recognition that the problem is a systems problem. Thus, we propose that uh, the food system be used as unit of analysis rather than the farm. By the way, we are happy to note that the United Nations also uses our analytical approach and has initiated a series of programs aimed at improving the global food system. Indeed, uh, the theme of this year's FAO programs is food systems. And our own secretary Dar was designated as uh, the food systems lead for the Philippines. I'm also encouraged by uh, the, the presentation of uh, uh, Yusek Leo here, which uh, proposes policy shift, uh, taking into account uh, the system's nature of uh, agriculture. Through the food systems analysis, well, we found that the problem is more than just the farmer remaining poor or indeed becoming poorer even as more money is poured repeatedly into agricultural development. Worse, consumers are also dying of chronic diseases. This is because the food that the modern food industry is producing is dictated not by consumer health, but by price, convenience, and taste. All of this are achieved by processing, which means eliminating the nutritious parts of the grain in the case of rice and wheat, so, they, so that they do not spoil easily during transport and handling from production areas that have comparative advantage to uh, cities that are far away. Taste is achieved by using a lot of sugar and salt in manufacturing of processed food products. Convenience is achieved through fast food restaurants where unhealthy oil is used and reused to make the popular fried, fried chicken because it is cheaper. All of this constitute a recipe for diabetes, high blood pressure, strokes, and heart attack, which are the leading causes of mortality today. The environment also suffers from resource depletion, pollution, and climate change. Because, this is because the food commodities and production systems used by the modern food industry are wasteful of water, soil, and energy. It also pollutes soil and water and contributes to uh, uh, biodiversity loss. The problem is more serious than most of, the, of us are willing to admit. We have a seriously dysfunctional food system. So how do we correct the uh, dysfunctional uh, food system? We have defined the full strategy in uh, uh, the document Feeding Metro Manila in 2050. It is a document prepared by a multi-sectoral team of 15 organiz organizations, including farmers, universities, the private sector, and uh, research organizations such as Phil Rice. If you want to know more about this, please watch the second installment of a series of uh, NAST in Science Information Fora on the subject. This is scheduled on Monday, uh, March 29. The good news is that the trigger for uh, solving the problem is very simple and entirely within our control. It is uh, at the consumption end of the food system. Responsible consumption is the trigger. We need to change dietary preference from one that kills us, the farmer and the environment, to one that is regenerative and nourishing uh, for everyone. This dietary recommendation is referred to in literature as the uh, planetary health diet. The planetary health diet is uh, basically plant-based and it differs from the usual dietary recommendation in the sense that it seeks to uh, satisfy not only the health and nutrition of consumers, but also the need uh, to protect the environment. So how will this work? 
if consumers start uh, eating a more diverse diet, plant-based food as prescribed by the planetary health diet, farmers will follow as expected in a demand-driven system, which is visualized by uh, NS Abia. They will also produce more diverse food. The final outcome will be restructuring of Philippine agriculture from one dominated by rice, corn, and coconut to one that will have more grains, vegetables, starchy root and tuber crops, milk, and fish. Our rough calculation suggests that adherence to the planetary health diet will, will require reduction of rice production by about 36%, chicken and other poultry by 39%, eggs by 72%, and beef, lamb, and pork by 86%. There you are. We have a solution for our pork shortages. On the other hand, it will require increases in production of grain legumes, vegetables, dairy foods, fish, root and tuber crops by 3,493%, 1,440%, 183%, 100%, and 31% uh, respectively. In practical terms, uh, this means rice growers shifting from rice, rice, rice to rice, legumes, vegetable, or root crops with fish, mushrooms, and livestock thrown into the production system. Some of them may have to abandon rice cultivation entirely. Coconut growers may have to do dairy cattle or, uh, <clears throat> or carabao grazing uh, between the trees. Farmers will learn more and their environment uh, will be better. The idea of multiple cropping is not new, but it has not taken root with few exceptions in the Philippines because consumers did not support it. Phil Rice, for example, has been trying to sell the idea through the uh, Palayamanan program initiated by Leo Sebastian when he was director of Phil Rice with little success. Indeed, in the last 50 years, Consumers shifted diet in the opposite direction from more diverse uh, to less diverse. Now let us put the shoe in the other foot. Let the consumer take the lead and let the farmers support it. Another change in consumer uh, behavior that may be needed is uh, the shift into local food. Uh, this is the scientific way. Uh, you can imagine uh, that the food habits and uh, foodstuff uh, production has evolved over millennia together. And this resulted in optimal diet and optimal uh, menu or uh, a list of uh, foodstuff that are locally uh, adapted. If we shift to local food, then uh, this is an assurance of the diversity because uh, uh, the Philippines has uh, a diverse uh, climate uh, and uh, geography and uh, the local food is equally diverse. Thus, uh, uh, Ilocano uh, diet is different from diet in Pampanga. By the way, I may note here uh, that uh, local foods such as uh, insects, which are uh, favorites in Pampanga, are uh, uh, insects are very efficient converter of feed. Uh, the ratio is about one kilo of feed to one kilo of uh, body mass. Compare this with our popular food, uh, the most of efficient of which is chicken, and the conversion ratio is three is to one. Uh, Fish is competing very well with a ratio of one is to 1.5. But fish is something that we should uh, eat more because of our, uh, of our archipelagic nature. It's more common uh, in, in everywhere in, in the Philippines. So uh, shifting 
behavioral change and among consumers is uh, is uh, the best way of uh, uh, lifting our farmers out of poverty. If our consumers local food, then the farmers can produce them. We can save maybe up to 700 billion peso in terms of import. And this will go to uh, the local farmers. But uh, shifting food preference uh, and uh, achieving greater diversity in the farms is a long is a long term process. In the NAST vision, we need one generation of Filipinos or 30 years to achieve this objective. So what is doable in the near term? It is giving the farmer a greater share of the consumer peso. The problem is best illustrated in the case of coffee. In this example, the coffee producer gets only US dollar seven cents out of uh, US dollar 217 per cup of coffee that the consumers spend at the retail level. Clearly, as this figure shows, money is made not in producing coffee, but in processing and selling it. If you want to lift the farmer out of poverty, he must get a bigger share of the consumer peso. So how do we give the farmer a greater share of the consumer peso? Two things. First is involvement of farmers in value adding. Sell the finished product instead of raw materials. I'm happy to note that there are initiatives by government agencies uh, in this direction, notably uh, DOST's Food Innovation Centers, uh, which provides facilities and technology for processing by small growers. And uh, lately, uh, the Department of Agriculture's concept of uh, agribusiness corridors and the initiative to put up cold stores for uh, perishable products such as fish. The cold stores are essential not only to reduce waste by spoilage, but also to give the small farmer or fisher folk bargaining power. He does not have to worry that his produce will spoil while in the process of bargaining with the trader. We need more of these facilities. And as uh, Yusek Leo pointed out, scale is the key for impact. Second is uh, direct selling. selling. This got a boost from the pandemic, and we can only hope that the trend continues with support from the government in terms of establishing the logistical and digital infrastructure needed and regulations that will ensure food safety among other requirements. The system can only be sustained if it demonstrates reliability, safety, and traceability. There is a lot to be done in this direction, but fortunately, the technological tools are available. Blockchain, artificial intelligence, digital payments, among others. So uh, to reach my take home message, I have only two. In the long term, responsible consumption is the key. And fortunately, it is within our control. It is the consumer's ball game. And uh, to do this, uh, we must adopt the planetary health diet and second, eat local food. In the short term, uh, we need to give farmers a greater share of the consumer peso. The government and a private sector with a conscience can help. Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Academician Dong, uh, for your comments. Okay, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions now to our uh, distinguished uh, guest speaker and also our panelists. Uh, 
if you have a question please you may write it down in the chat uh, in the chat or you can uh, indicate in the reaction you can raise your hand if you want to be recognized uh, and ask your questions personally any questions uh, Is Yusek uh, Leo still around? Uh, I know he has uh, another important meeting to attend to. If you have questions uh, for uh, Dr. Uh, Leo Sebastian, you may ask it now. You know, I don't have a question, but I'd like to reinforce some of the points that were brought up. Which go, ahead, Joel, are... go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, so I'd like to thank, of course, uh, Dr. Javier, uh, Yusek, uh, Sebastian, and our two panelists. I completely agree with the six um, uh, points that uh, uh, Dr. Javier uh, presented to us for advancing Philippine agriculture. Um, I just want to highlight two things. The first one is I'm really glad that he underscored uh, uh, the critical need uh, for aggregating some of the uh, small farms in the Philippines to form uh, farmers associations. I think this is really critical because, of course, by doing so, one achieves economy of scale. Uh, but, but at the same time, I, I like also what he uh, indicated that uh, it's very important to, to treat uh, and view Filipino farmers by the government, by UPLB, by other agencies in, and institutions as business entrepreneurs, because they are business entrepreneurs. If they fail, they fail in their business. And so this really helps bring into focus the critical need uh, that farmers need assistance in terms of connecting them to all the necessary inputs that they need, be it credit, be it technology, and so on and so forth. And then as, as um, Dr. Javier also pointed out, link them to the markets uh, by contract growing and so on and so forth. I refer to that as strategic agriculture. Uh, before I got reunited with colleagues in the Philippines, I, I actually started a global initiative here at the University of Arizona. I refer to it as a global initiative for strategic agriculture in dry lands because of my connection with the Middle East and my research uh, for the most part is focused in the Middle East. I was looking then searching the world for example of strategic agriculture and I didn't find a good example until about five years ago I was invited to Leyte for a conference and that's where I found a perfect example of strategic agriculture uh, because Leyte Governor uh, Mick Patilia has instituted um, farmers associations, organizing farmers, linking them to technology and everything they need, and then also linking them to uh, uh, the uh, market like McDonald's and Jollibee and so on and so forth. And so unsurprisingly, all of these um, uh, farmers associations really thrive and have been thriving. And there's now about 250 such associations in Leyte. And in 2015, uh, the poverty incidence in Leyte was as high as 20, 24%. And the governor is now confident that that can go down to about 9% in another two years in 2022. So I, I really support what uh, Dr. Habir pointed out in regard to uh, really uh, organizing uh, cooperatives and farmers associations and, and really uh, providing them capacity building so that they could succeed as a business because that's what they are. Agriculture is a business uh, for individual farmers, groups of farmers, provinces, and even as a national business in terms of connecting them to export destinations. So I, I think that's, that's the right route. <laughs> okay, thank you, Joel, for your comments. Uh, at this point, maybe go recognize uh, Sir Joe Cruz. Go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, let me congratulate everyone, but particularly the inspiring talk of National Science this year. I agree with his six points and that he wanted to focus on one of them namely the aggregation of the small farms into bigger units and also aggregating the irrigation into bigger associations. And I would like to make a comment or suggestion or maybe a question that has to do with enhancing 
the possible su the, the success of looking at the near term for that aggregation. And I'm talking about the role of digital transformation. Digital transformation is the endpoint of what we have in our Department of Information and Communications Technologies or ICT or DICT. So digital transformation in the end should be embedded and owned by the, by the agriculture, uh, different sectors of, of, um, of, of, of clustering. However, perhaps in the near term, what might happen is that there will be small startup companies that could do the digital transformation so that databases could be exchanged and not be, and the agricultural experts would not be burdened with that. So there'll be small companies that would probably start up to enable the digital transformation, but in the, in the beginning, just exchange of data and keeping of data flow. In particular, if we have to sell to Nestle and others, they need to know a lot of stuff that's digital and maybe uh, the thrust of the number two uh, strategy of, um, of um, national scientists have here could be enhanced without putting a lot more effort, except that you just have to make it uh, enticing and provide incentives for possible small companies to form these um, digitalization or the transformation of the ICT system so that we'll have data throughout to interconnect hundreds, if thousands, at least hundreds of these small clusters. Once you have hundred clusters, it'll be difficult to do that manually. So you need all this digital stuff. So may I have some comments or maybe uh, criticisms from National Scientist Javier. Yeah, that, that's one of the things I cited as uh, some immediate uh, relevance from the new technologies, uh, linking farmers directly to consumers, to markets, linking them to the, root, to the bank so that they will be more ready to loan. But I think uh, we should ask Al, because in a dialogue earlier, uh, I called attention to a statement by Tito Aliga that there are some people from the UP engineering group precisely doing this, these uh, platforms linking farmers to markets, to banks, and, and so forth and so on. Maybe I'll, we should ask, I'll, uh, you know, okay, sir. At Serapico. Okay, Serapico. Uh, I'll, uh, okay. Uh, I mean, just to describe to you where it is right now, I've been mentoring Propital. They actually get money from millennials and they rent it and they loan it to the communities of these millennials to the farmers in those locations where they have information from the uh, farm uh, suppliers as well as hardwares where they do the farm implement. So yun yung pinaka credit rating. That's how they got their credit. Today, so they, they're loaned close to 150 million. Nothing to sneeze at, but I, they were almost at 100 million in year two. But I challenged them to get to breach that and scale them up and gave them connections to get to the agri-agra law fines that is being paid by the banks. I had several board members from the big banks. They said, I will give you the money if you can show that the system works. And clearly, it has not happened, mainly from the resistance from the founders, to scale up. So there are gaps still that we're trying to fill up now. So that's one area uh, we need to uh, show bigger models. I know of three existing uh, uh, companies that are doing just that in the last three years. One was a former country manager of ING who's been funded to $100 million worth to put up a system that was being done in Vietnam three years ago and using social media and data coming from their telephones on how much they consume so they can lend them money. It's not yet a complete one, uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Emil, but definitely with what I hear here, here today, there is bits and pieces of those puzzles that we can complete moving forward 
Another one that's being done actually is by Glenn Gregorio and Siarca, where there are towns already producing and bringing it up here. I had the same experience three months ago where I brought, tried to connect a cheese manufacturer from Davao, Malagos, to be able to bring her product here because the orders of PAL, the air, airline, has gone to zero after being a one-ton order a month. He was about, she was about to kill her goats who <laughs> produces the milk for her cheese. That was how dire situations were. And because I told her that in North Green Hills, like Forbes and Dasmarinas, people still want good cheese. If you can connect to the people who market in those areas, they can bring it over here. They can take care of the logistics. They can complete the supply chain. So those are the kinds of issues. Uh, but I, I agree from both the side of Dr. Leo Sebastian that definitely we should learn more about what's happening around us in ASEAN, but at the same time, localize that information and create models. I like the Renucci model that Joel intimated in LATEC, where they produce the Renucci rice and bang marketed not only locally, but worldwide. My question is how can we make sure that they get scaled up? Because to me, it's the same issue that uh, Father Nebres addressed with us. We have a lot of good programs, but we're not scaling it up. And I heard the same thing again coming from uh, National Scientist Javier, that definitely those are the key ones. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, but I, I'm happy that you said that there are some working models with PBSP. My, my father in law happens to be vice chairman of Philippine Business for Social Progress. And I would love to be able to put our minds and science in terms of how to scale up those models. So please, uh, National Scientist Javier, let's work on trying to identify those in various sectors. USAID, uh, Stride, where, where I've been part of the last seven years, I've been funding some of this agricultural and coffee and cacao, and clearly, and even NIPA to alcohol, which I have a grant meeting tomorrow. I mean, these are existing models that I wish I can entice everyone <laughs> to help us on the ground, in the front, and eventually put private sector money to make it sustainable. Uh, I pose the challenge to you. Uh, the question I had is, if I had 100 million on the table today, actually, where should I bring it? Where should I put it? Dr. Javier, Dr. Rasco, and Leo, and Ben. Which one would be your best, uh, <laughs> best swing at the piñata or swing at the bat for me? if I were to do that today, if I wanted to become a farmer. I, it's just a hypothetical question, but we can have that conversation. But it is happening, definitely connecting with uh, Raul Favelia and, and uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Chris Monterola, who's a fellow member and fellow academician uh, on big data, on how to use what Leo mentioned in, in uh, replicating the data in Vietnam is another thing that's happening in the banks. Now, can we do that in agriculture? So the two can connect and open up that whole agri agra law of, of, of capital, which is one bank alone pays 350 million a year down the drain to the central bank. They'd rather loan that money if it won't affect their credit rating capability. So again, we are hold a little bit pieces of the puzzle, and it's a work in progress completing that puzzle per ecosystem, per crop, per technology. So Again, I just want everyone to be aware that uh, I'm here and I'm here to help, but I don't have the answers. And I heard some of the answers today, what I've been looking for for the last five years, wanting to help Agri. And uh, it makes me want to be a gentleman farmer, guys. So good job. <laughs> Thank you. But hopefully we all want to be uh, doing that. Indeed, the uh, upper half wanting to help the lower half by being a farmer themselves. I'm raising my hand already. Thank you, Al. So, Thank yeah. you. Thank you all for your comments. Surely we'll help follow up conversations on this matter and uh, we'll encourage participation from, from the different sectors. At this point, may I recognize uh, the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension of UPLB, uh, Vice Chancellor Bing Lee. Uh, Bing, uh, you have any question? Go ahead. Hello, sir. Good morning. Nagagaling ko lang yeah. po dito sa kabilang uh, laptop din kasi may meeting ng 10 o'clock. But anyway, thank you, thank you for paase. Uh, thank you, Ma'am Giselle. And thank you, Ma'am Sean, for the invitation. Uh, attend po ako ng uh, outtaking sa April 8. Uh, um, galing ako sa IPB. So, ibig sabihin, uh, mga tatay ko na si uh, Sir Emil Q. Uh, 
Sir Dong, grabe nung isang uh, uh, visit ko sa farm niya, siguro limang, ar- limang oras po kaming uh, nagdi-discuss tungkol dito nga sa uh, topic na ito. Um, mas- ma- me- meron din po ako kasing uh, experience nung bata ako na uh, successful na successful yung aming uh, family enterprise pero because of big businesses na nababankrupt, doon po nagkakaroon ng uh, malaking uh, um, constraint. Uh, we were able to uh, have at least 100 farmers uh, nag-build ang daddy ko ng cooperative. Uh, but then, meron po talagang uh, um, hindi ko maintindihan sa system. Kaya hanggang ngayon, uh, paano po kaya natin may engage ang mga farmers natin in order for their economic bata pa po ako, ganun na po ang aking uh, exposure sa daddy ko pero hanggang ngayon uh, kahit nasa agriculture na ako hindi ko pa rin po alam kung paano po natin ito isusulong pero siguro based from my experience babalik po talaga tayo sa cooperative cooperativa uh, siguro yung handling ng cooperativa ay kapag merong social uh, order at social justice doon sa place na yon kaya nga siguro ang Leyte ay very very uh, uh, successful because behind noong kanilang cooperative ay nandun yung concern for the farmers if ang agriculture ang Department of Agriculture can have that kind of model i think uh, uh, yun po ang tutungo ni natin talagang it should have be, it should be a cluster of farmers together and then nandiyan ang backup ng uh, DA with social concern, may social order, may social justice. And then meron po talagang dapat na uh, social worker kasi ang daddy ko social worker. Kaya at first naging successful yung cooperative pero dahil nagkaroon ng uh, uh, crisis sa banana industry, uh, na bankrupt po yung aming uh, bamboo uh, uh, cooperative. Kaya... Uh, siguro there should be a very very strong linkage ng uh, private and uh, um, public institution kapag we will handle this kind of cooperative, uh, farmer cooperative. So uh, siguro yun yung isa na malalim na naging experience ko so that hanggang ngayon kaya nga ka, ka, yung, yung nag, uh, uh, nag uh, ano ng um, coconut na kung pwedeng lagyan din natin ng trellis Iniisip ko rin yan dito sa aming Pili Drive. Baka pwede naming lagyan ng uh, kawayan na trellis at pagapangin kahit patola lang. <laughs> so yung mga ganong silly idea, naiisip ko rin kasi bata pa po kami. Exposed na exposed na po talaga kami sa farm. Uh, siguro yun din po ang pwede nating, especially kapag merong 10 by 10. Kasi ang ginawa po ng, uh, ng uh, farm, ng Sawata Enterprise po, ang tawag ng family enterprise namin noon, uh, doon sa 10 by 10 ng mga coconut farmers, uh, sa gitna po kami nagtanim ng kawayan and it's very very successful that doon sa gitna pa ng uh, kawayan at uh, uh, anyog, meron pa po kami itinan- tinanim na lakatan na saging. Kaya napaka prosperous noon time na lumalaki kami na yun po ang aming naging model. In between those uh, coconut uh, trees ay may kawayan sa gitna at doon pa sa in between nung 10 by 10 na uh, uh, kawa, uh, coconut ay naglagay kami ng saba or lakatan. Uh, that was in the early 70s and uh, siguro ang Davao del Norte noon napaka rich niya kasi ang dami naming saging, ang dami naming kawayan, ang ganda-ganda ng coconut. But noong lumagpak ang uh, banana industry na yun yung uh, uh, mainly um, naging income ng mga tao kasi dinadala uh, income ng mga uh, uh, bamboo farmers nung lumagpak ang banana industry na walan ng uh, kita and I think yun, hindi na kami nakarecover na bankrupt yung aming family enterprise uh, bumalik na ang mga farmers uh, pinutol nila ang kanilang mga kawayan at ibinalik na nila either sa pagtatanim ng kasaba pagtatanim ng corn so yun po yung napakabigat na experience ko na nag, nag-bankrupt pero we were very very successful in a cooperative because daddy was a very very good manager at that time. 
And so if we can if we can relate yung uh, experience na yon kung naniwala lang talaga ang uh, government noon na dapat yung mga kawayan namin ay i-convert namin into a small handicraft industry uh, yun yun pinaglalaban ni Daddy noon pero hindi nakinig ang DTI, hindi nakinig ang uh, kaya sayang talaga yung uh, naging uh, perspective niya, naging vision niya noon for the Davao del Norte Bamboo Cooperative. It should have been the first cooperative in the country na naging successful kung nakinig lang yung government at hindi masyado din siyang ginipit ng mga private industries. So, I'd like to uh, share that uh, experience of ours. Pero naniniwala pa rin po ako, uh, umaangat na po ngayon ang kahalagahan ng kawayan. Uh, marami na pong may gustong magkawayan because this is towards the green economy. And then, ang laki-laki din po ng role ng kawayan para po sa ating agricultural sector. And I hope, uh, uh, being an entomologist, pero so passionate about kawayan, uh, yun pa rin po ang isinusulong ko ngayon. Uh, labong from uh, kawayan, uh, kawayan for our trellises, kawayan for kawayan for our uh, 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 clean air. Uh, sana makita rin itong ng Department of Agriculture. Kasi kung 1DA ay talagang uh, ridge to reef at dapat diverse crops na talaga at diverse na pag-iisip. Uh, yun po, yun po. And uh, na-overwhelm lang po ako kasi uh, from IPB, sa aking mga mentors, uh, they supported me and uh, I will also support Paase and I hope itong aking advocacy ito ay uh, uh, maisusulong po natin forward. Marami pong salamat. Para thank, you. Na thank you very much, <laughs> Bing. Thank you very much, Vice Bing. Would any one of our speakers uh, respond to that? None, uh, Hello? Yeah, go ahead. And uh, mute po kayo, sir. No, I'm not. Uh, if anyone. Sir Ino, naka mute po kayo. Uh, you know, let me reply to that. Okay, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. <clears throat> we have uh, organized uh, thousands of cooperatives, uh, merong irrigators association, uh, reform beneficiaries organization, and so on. Many have succeeded, but many, many more have failed. And the common problems have been, uh, I think, three things. Yung uh, lack of business acumen among the leaders, anong klaseng negosyo ang pupuntahan nila. Uh, they don't have links to the markets. And, and I, uh, the shadowy part is many of them failed because of lack of sufficient financial controls, uh, misbehavior ng mga leaders, and so on. Now, ang problema, yung mga extension agents natin uh, promoting uh, cooperatives, not to disparage them. They are not the business people themselves. So kailangan natin, yung maging coach ng mga cooperatives natin, people who have business acumen, who have been there. Kaya nga nakikita ko, yung mga yung uh, corporate organizations, maraming silang mga tao, nagre-retire na, very young and so on. They can become business coaches of uh, these uh, cooperatives both as uh, CSR effort or uh, talagang yung kasama sa business model nila yung getting the farmers organized in co-op uh, as business partners. Kaya nga nakita ko yung opportunity, yung model ng PBSP because PBSP hires uh, young people but they are business management types. Yun ang kailangan natin na mag maging coaches ng mga cooperatives. Right now, Ang emphasis ng ating extension sa COB is regulation. Eh, kailangan din yon pero mas kailangan yung business orientation. So, uh, of course, there are many other sources, pero ang nakita kong immediate source ay eh, yung mga agribusiness and uh, big companies. Kaya nga sabi ko, eh, if Ramon Ang can pledge 1 to 2 billion to dredge to the River, San Miguel can have a core of business managers, retired and so forth, graduates of 
uh, business schools uh, and of course agriculture to be the coaches of uh, of uh, these cooperatives you know we could have we could have uh, uh, advice uh, business companies to do it on on, on a business basis uh, they will advise so many co-ops and they are paid on performance of the co-ops Mar maraming mga possibilities yan. but going back to the point of uh, being yun ang kukulang natin uh, business people to lead the cooperatives. So they need business coaching and then financial controls and the connections to markets, especially and suppliers and the supply chain. Okay, thank you very much, National Scientist Abir. Uh, by uh, being, there are also some comments uh, in the chat, so you can look at that. At this point, uh, may I call on uh, Vic Ilag? Vic? You have the floor. Go ahead. Uh, sorry, didn't expect. Uh, congratulations, uh, Dr. Javier. Uh, as a classmate of my parents, so. <laughs> and uh, LB graduate, but didn't major in uh, agriculture. In any way, I promised my father I won't go to agriculture, but I promise, uh, I, I didn't major in agriculture, but I promise that I will circle back, okay? So even though based in Australia, so I'm with the company Plantex, we actually have operations in Tacloban, um, in the north part of Tacloban, Suhi. And one of the challenges we have actually, and actually we're partly owned now by Agri Nurture, and it's still in the process. And one of the challenges we have, I mean, it's a good discussion, but I think, so we're a private company. We've, uh, we've refurbished the old aquaculture hatchery, uh, uh, EU funded, which is in Samar. But at the same time, we were planning to build a high, an, a state-of-the-art milling and drying plant in Tacloban. So we had a financial statement, um, business plan. The payback would be within two years, but we applied for three years already and never had and gotten the funding. We also have plans for building fisheries. So, although there's a lot of talk, I'm a bit. Forgive me if it's my position. I'm a bit skeptical. I think it's all talk, but I think it's poor on the delivery. So how could we, or how, I mean, how do you implement such of these proposals if it, uh, we ourselves on the front end are having problems in trying to implement something? You know, may I uh, respond? Okay, go ahead, sir, go ahead. Uh, actually, yung sinasabi kong co-op, the real guy behind our co-op was the dad of uh, Vic, si Odi Ilag, na classmate namin sa Class 60, both uh, his parents, uh, Lina and Odi, uh, cum laude graduates, Class 60. At yung sinasabi kong co-op, eh, wala, wala naman akong masyadong alam sa co-op, eh, pero yan ang buhay ni Odi Ilag except that he passed away early. So yan talaga ang, uh, among us, well, we have other people sa co-op movement sa Los Banos, but Odi Ilag really stands out. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away early. Pero we cannot give up. We have to persevere on those uh, farmer organizations and co-op because that's the only way forward. Uh, yeah. The smallness is a given, a political cultural given, but we can go around it by organizing them into producers groups that will link to the markets, process the, the product themselves and go to the market themselves. Yeah. Thank you, okay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, at this point, maybe call on Dr. Toby Dairit. Sir, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, good morning to everyone. And yeah, I, I'm Hindi ako agriculture, so talaga nakikinig lang ako. And I'm not a businessman also. But, um, well, I've been, I've been working with the VCO industry. And, um, well, we realized it, it's, it's a very uh, perishable product. And um, while it's a good industry to get into, we should not underestimate the amount of uh, training and, you know, the technology needed to <clears throat> uh, get into it. As you know, there are three processes, fermentation, expeller, and centrifuge. Um, 
of course, yung pinakamura yung fermentation, but that's also the most vulnerable. Um, it can be produced well, but you need to have the, um, parang dapat may training ka ng microbiologist. Para talagang, saka you really need food tech people to, to do it properly. Um, <clears throat> the expeller is, of course, that, that's originally made for mga Peter Paul, yung mga malalaki. Um, but there are also micro expellers that can be made. <clears throat> Uh, and then you have centrifuge, which is the most expensive. Um, now, you, the first VCO that was made in the year 2000 was fermentation. Uh, but then many people, um, well, a lot of those failed, mainly because of quality. Um, we were in the process of updating the Philippine National Standard for VCO. Um, also to you know raise the level, because all the other uh, countries have adopted basically what we have, so we have to um, stay in front of the you know, of the game, so to speak. And then we have to also worry about adulteration because it's becoming a problem. <clears throat> so that's what the new PNS is. But at the same time, um, tulad ng sinabi nung ano nung iba, pwedeng itaas mo yung technology pero may iwanan yung mga mahirap. So I think the challenge we have now is to look <laughs> for um, technologies appropriate to the small, the micro scale. And I think we really need, you know, more organization, um, consolidation, et cetera. Um, the LGUs, I think, have the money, but sa kanila, nagbibigay lang ng pera yan, pang election yan eh. Um, but unless you have the technology, you know, the food tech people to run it, it's not gonna be sustainable. Sayang lang yung pera. And of course, the other thing is, um, hindi pwedeng busy o lang produkto. So we need to look at all of the byproducts mm -hmm. and um, you know take advantage of that. So it you know it's a multi-product resource, but at the same time, um, it's an opportunity. But then if you don't, uh, if you can't manage the other products, they, they become a burden. Because then you have waste problems, etc. Although you know they sell it to the piggeries, yung ano. Pero kung nagkaroon ng ano yan, ng aflatoxin. The mga so everything has to be done properly. Ang thing ko yan, you know, the faster bacteria attack it, the more nutritious it is. Eh. <laughs> I think that's what coconut is. It's uh, very nutritious, so it's very perishable. So yun ang challenge, and uh, we really need to develop the technology that you know can be used by the small producers. The big producers can take care of themselves. So as ano, as NS uh, Emil correctly pointed out, we need to focus on the small producers so that they can also take advantage of this um, resource. So in lang, and then but I, I really enjoy this. But I have some suggestions. I don't know, maybe they're a bit far out. Um, but you know, uh, I, I think one of the problems here is really bring down the coconuts. Hindi mo pwedeng pabagsakin yan kasi gagawin mo ng BCO kasi magka-crack you have all these problems. So they really have to be brought down uh, carefully. And then kung may... I mean, if you can barcode the, I know, the bunch of coconuts, why not? That's the start of your traceability. Um, many people are, you know, talking about this, ano, itong, ito, the technology of ano, traceability. And, you know, if we have the IT and if we can start it properly and, you know, make it cheap, uh, why not? Um, when you sell it the abroad, maraming yan. Even, you know, the wine, gusto nila traceable yung wine. They can locate it to the days where it was grown. Um, why can't we do it with coconut? So yeah, I think there are many opportunities, but certainly, um, you know, we have to put all the elements together. And do not have a small part. I think we need a whole ecosystem to do this. Okay, salamat. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. <laughs> Toby. Uh, okay, at this point, uh, Ma'am Giselle, go ahead. Um, thanks, uh, Ino. Thanks, Toby. I just want to uh, follow through your comment, in particular on coconut, but it would apply to other uh, products like tea oil. So bottom line, uh, we believe is the chemistry, even underlying uh, food microbiology and uh, food science. So I think, uh, and as Emil, you need to uh, uh, get uh, the inputs from uh, the chemists and the biochemists at this point, because that is what would ensure the quality of the product. So we're talking about value chains. And the first is to secure uh, the quality of the product uh, over the, uh, uh, the uh, 
to the har post harvest as well. So um, I also wanted to invite another professor emeritus of UP Los Banos. This is uh, Ernie Lozada, because we are aware of his um, multi-integrated um, development of coconut, which Toby emphasized is not just VCO, and dami pang other high value added products. So I understand he's now very busy uh, working on some plans uh, with the PCA. So we're very hopeful that something will come out of his um, uh, integrated um, development of coconut. He's been uh, championing for many years now, okay? Now, um, aside from that, I would like to speak on behalf of one of our Pase stalwarts, Rigoberto Gobet Advincula, also a NAST corresponding member who can uh, make good use of uh, the uh, nano-crystalline um, cellulose that you find in coconut and other crops. And I think that um, the um, additive manufacturing and 3D manufacturing uh, printing of uh, Gobet would uh, be a very significant contribution to uh, the development of coconut-based products. This brings me now to, um, well, a plan to um, try to get uh, Toby and uh, Gobet and others working on coconut uh, with uh, NS Emil and, um, and Ernie Lozada, the Ernie Lozada, okay? And um, maybe one uh, application uh, would be in um, the, the, the site that is described by one of our participants today who made a very impressive presentation at the NAST uh, mm -hmm. uh, webinar. Uh, this is um, Mr. Gualberto. So I would like to give him a chance to speak about this hubs and spokes model because it, it also touches on the idea of co-ops. Uh, so uh, spokes, uh, co-ops perhaps uh, specializing in uh, some products of coconut, so yung pot then, and then meron siyang centralized uh, hub. Okay, now sa co-op, uh, NS Emil, alam natin na the government, at least during the time of Pinoy, gave so much money to the co-ops for the equipment that they, 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 they need. Kaso, uh, kinalawang lang yung mga equipment, walang marunong gumamit. Okay. So it uh, highlights the importance of technical training of technology, which is what we in PASE and, and, and ASD are supposed to be. Okay. So we need to get the farmers trained uh, in uh, the use of uh, even the basic uh, farm equipment. Now, wala silang parang um, fear or um, fear of, uh, of, of uh, no knowing. What Toby described as um, simple machines in um, required for um, fermentation, fra fractionation, uh, to uh, reduce adulteration, totohanan lang, rancidity is always a problem with our VCO and even our pili oil, okay? Uh, yung mga ganong bagay dapat uh, matutunan ng mga, ng mga um, spokes doon sa co-ops with the help of our technical experts. Which brings me now to further on in the value chain and you want to um, shortcut this. You want to short circuit uh, by, you know, connecting the farmers with the business people. And uh, this idea of Ramon Ang helping us is worth pursuing uh, NSME. We have to find connections with him ASAP, okay? But let me tell you on the longer term what some of our PASA members are doing now. In particular, I would like to cite what Chris Monterola has set up in AIM. So he has this master's uh, program in innovation and business. And I have sat as a panelist in some of their thesis presentations. His focus is really on um, uh, social, social good. So he has his students working on food and agriculture products, energy, environment, health and disease. But what is the thrust of the students? The students try to come up with apps or with programs designs precisely to um, deliver better goods to uh, the market at, uh, in a timely way and to cut the cost. So yun yung program ng MSIB ng AIM. I wish Chris 
would be here and I tried to contact him, pero he is very busy. So let me say na ang captive market pa nila dyan, I think, eh, yung mga anak ng mga sinasaba ninyong mga rich, no, na yung upper half. Okay, so the best way to get this thing um, implemented is to convince, say, the next generation of the wealthy families to um, get into tech and to invest in agriculture. And I think AIM is doing a great job doing this under the new program run by Chris Monterola, Erica Lagara, and others who came from UP. So at this point, I wish that we would give uh, Mr. Gilberto a chance to speak. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, this is a, a response to uh, Dr. Toby's uh, uh, statement. Uh, and I understand uh, following what uh, NS Emil said, uh, we have to get out of co uh, coconut oil because there's no chance for us to compete with palm oil. But uh, aside from uh, coconut virgin oil or virgin coconut oil, which, is, which uh, has reached again the price of about $3.60, $3.60 per liter now, there are, uh, uh, there are uh, products from coconut that can get uh, global acceptance. But uh, these are considered new product developments again because uh, this was not uh, properly handled before. And I'm talking of young coconut water and young coconut meat. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, 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 biotechnology because as uh, was said in a number of statements, uh, coconut uh, products are very, very fragile to handle. And uh, also uh, the uh, problem of logistics and the cool chain system is not uh, uh, fully and uh, well established in the country, especially this has been aggravated by uh, the pandemic. So what we have done is to come up, we have downscaled our multi-fruit, uh, integrated multi-fruit uh, processing system based on coconut. And uh, we have done the hub and spoke. We are doing it now. We are about to start uh, uh, a major uh, development in uh, Southern Luzon. And we are putting our hub. Uh, this is the central processing station. Uh, and uh, we have developed, uh, we are starting to put up spokes. Uh, this will be the satellite uh, processing areas that can handle 10,000 to 20,000 coconuts per day. Instead of concentrating it in just one area, we are uh, looking at how we could put it, for example, in uh, Baler, Quezon, and then uh, transport uh, the semi-processed products from Baler all the way to Santo Tomas, Batangas with a uh, refrigerated van. But this will deal first on two products, as I've said, coconut, young coconut meat, and young coconut water. And uh, the handling of this is quite uh, precarious because as uh, Dr. Toby said, you cannot just handle, you cannot just harvest seven months, eight months old coconut, uh, coconuts. Because uh, uh, if you just pull this, uh, you are going to uh, break this and there will be fermentation and invasion of microorganism. So we have to change the business model so that there will be no rejects on the part of the farmers. So from six months to 10 months, we will be able to accept it. Only we have to change the manner of harvesting by hoisting, by going up the trees and hoisting it by ropes. But we have eliminated the uh, the, uh, the chance of uh, a lot of rejects because we are going to accept six months to 10 months old coconuts. Uh, the, uh, the development of this would mean that the farmers will not wait uh, will will not wait for 11 months, 12 months for their 
uh, coconuts to be harvested so that they turn around this uh, pas uh, pasture on the part of the farmers. And we can assure that uh, there will be a higher return, uh, three top uh, net price on the part of the farmers. Uh, now that the uh, coconut is sparse and uh, I mean, uh, it, uh, the supply is small because of the uh, con uh, continuous uh, exposure of the Philippines to form basic, uh, I mean, strong typhoons uh, la the last quarter of last year, uh, the price of coconuts has increased. Uh, one coconut right now roughly is averaging about 15 pesos, but soon, in another two, three months, this will drop again to about five or seven pesos. Now, there, there should be sustainability on the, per, on the, uh, the, on, uh, the pricing of the coconuts on the part of the farmers. And so when we develop this spoke, we will be able to organize the farmers to be part of the uh, business. They will be owning 50% at least of the enterprise. And so uh, there, uh, uh, there will be more uh, value added to their uh, work, effort, and investment. Uh, aside from the price of the coconuts, they will share also in the uh, semi-processed products that will come from their products. So hopefully we will be able to launch this by June 1 and uh, we will be able to supply first the domestic need in terms of the young coconut water and uh, the uh, young coconut meat. But uh, the key here is the adoption of uh, uh, two or three uh, technologies that uh, our company uh, as a proprietary owner of this technology has improved. And one, uh, one of this is the uh, MST, the millisecond technology wherein we will be able to expose the products uh, uh, almost uh, unheated uh, not pasteurized at 70 degrees. And this will, uh, 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 under refrigerated condition, this can last for about two, three months. And the water can be subjected to IQF. Uh, while it is not a new technology, we have uh, improved uh, the system of IQF so that uh, 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 the water will last longer and it will not be exposed to uh, immediate, uh, I mean, uh, it can be exposed to immediate uh, low temperature over a period of short time. There is a big difference between blast freezing and IQF. These two technologies will make sure that this uh, uh, model of ours will be successful. We are attaching ourselves to the two products because we believe that these two products will be highly acceptable in the global market. We are not saying that uh, BCO will not be a profitable uh, product. In fact, uh, we are now looking at improving the model by including the matured coconuts in the spokes so that we will be able to process as well the matured coconuts into BCO. But uh, we are trying to improve uh, the raw BCO that comes from the spokes so that we will be able to refine this for better pricing. I think that is the, uh, in a nutshell, what we are doing right now. Thank you, Dr. Bing. And th thank you very much, uh, sir, for your comments. Uh, wonderful ideas. Uh, any, anyone would like to respond or share this yeah. or her? <clears throat> you know, Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. <clears throat> Go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Uh, Jose Toby started it and then we had a very good uh, reply from Billy Gualberto. I say, although I painted a very sour picture, but things are moving up, especially with uh, Willy Dar uh, and now with our new administrator and PCA who was uh, retired chief of staff, but who's a graduate of UP Rural High School. Uh, he was first year in Los Baños when I was uh, chancellor. Uh, anyway, uh, precisely this is what is going on now in the planning. So 85% of our coconut 
go to coconut oil. But coconut oil is a minor player in the vegetable oil market. And the farmers don't make much money from coconut oil. So the idea is to gradually shift our, uh, our coconut from coconut oil to the other high value products, including BCO, coconut water, desiccated coconut, coconut milk, and so forth and so on. So yun ang, yun ang kasama doon sa plano na ginagawa nila General Matrigal ngayon. A gradual shift from 85 to 15 to maybe 70 to 30 and so on. But increasingly uh, ship our uh, uh, coconut into higher value products like uh, BCO. But always making sure na kasama yung mga small farmer baka ang yayaman lamang yung mga processors and exporters. Dapat kasali sila. Kaya in the model of Billy Gualberto, and I'm happy he's mentioning it, the farmers will be part owners of the processing plant over a period of time. They will have equity. So yung income ng farmer, hindi lamang raw material supplier, meron din siyang dividend from the processing and export. Now, yung BCO, uh, I think we really have to organize the, the farmers, uh, the producers, especially the small ones, and help them in the quality of the BCO and help them in marketing, packaging, and in the export uh, business. Yan naman ay ginagawa na ng DOST at saka PCA to some extent. Pero marami pang magagawa dyan. But there is another idea. Uh, our BCO and our coconut water will have to compete in the world market of vegetable oils and beverages. But we have something going. We can claim that our coconuts are organic. Organic. Yun ang, yun ang ating leverage. So we, we must, as agronomists, uh, really work on how do we really authentically produce organic uh, uh, coconut to improve yields at the same time uh, have uh, quality. So Marian, uh, we may have to decide nationally that there will be islands which are going to be strictly organic coconut. So the certification will be easier. And of course, the supply chain, the value chain is easier to, to, to manage. So yan ang mga exciting things that going on. Uh, we are not entirely hopeless. Yan ang mga nangyayari ngayon. And uh, we hope that uh, with the more people involved, then we can really uh, get going. I'm excited uh, si Billy, mabuti nga dyan si Billy, kasi yung kanya, yung buko water, hindi yung mature coconut water. Yung coconut, of course, alam natin yun, yung mature coconut water, hindi masyadong masarap eh. Mas masarap yung buko water. So yun, we can really get uh, a premium for that. But anyway, my message is we are not entirely hopeless because precisely there are now moves to industrialized agriculture, especially coconut. And we hope that the cocoa levy funds will be used for this uh, fruitful uh, uh, beneficial uh, purposes, but making sure that the, the small guys are always in. They should always be in. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, uh, okay uh, Dr. Toby Dairit, go ahead. Uh, yes. I guess, salamat. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to uh, you know, maybe uh, supplement or uh, react to uh, no, um, Mr. Gualberto. Um, and these are things that we have to look at carefully. Right now, yung coconuts that are harvested 12 months old yan. And I think a lot of that is dahil din sa ano, copra. Ang gusto nung magkocopra, 12 months old. Ngayon, may, there's a, that is a fatty acid profile. And right now, the VCO as main, mainly defined is mature 12 month coconut oil and we have a fatty acid profile for that. What we have to do now, and this is a problem of optimization. If you're gonna, and I think we should standardize in the end, para, you know, as a, para iisa lang yung ating, ano, um, you know, better for the, for the value chain. Uh, if we move that from 12 months, let's say to 10 months or nine months, kasi you have several products which in a way will compete with each other. Una -una, let's say, for example, we say, hindi na muna 12 months, we harvest 10 months. Of course, paborians of farmer, kasi mas, mas mabilis yung kanyang, ano, yung kanyang harvest cycle. Uh, pero yung 10-month-old VCO, we'll have to check 
po yung fatty acid profile niya ay pasok pa dun sa ating standard. That's one. And then of course, you have to optimize the other products. So what I, I guess what, what this really means is that if there's a big move to optimize all of the other byproducts and we decide on a certain age, whether it's um, siguro kung 10 months, baka manipis pa yung meat niyan eh. So the yield of the VCO will be lower and the profile will be lower. So we have to now calculate ano yung return kung yun ang magiging income from the VCO versus the income from the other products. So it's a, with coconut, it's usually a system change. Eh. Hindi lang, hindi lang VCO ang titignan mo, pati na rin yung ibang produko, which, which, well, in a way, makes it more interesting, but also more challenging. And um, ngayon, we're doing the PNS for VCO. We, we now have to look, ano, kung if we make it, you know, it's supposed to be hopefully adopted within the next few months. Uh, we'll have to look at the profile for, say, a 10-month um, 10 month coconut, which we don't have. Kasi yung, the data we have, we collected actually VCO from Philippine producers, 12-month-old. So what we have are profiles for VCO, 12-month-old. Um, and I asked PC, wala naman silang data sa fatty acid profile ng VCO from other ages. Eh. So we'll have to look at that and see whether we can make allowances in advance for possible changes in the fatty acid profile. So anyway, yeah, just some, some things to look into. Okay, salamat. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Toby. Okay, uh, so a lot of ideas coming out and uh, I think uh, we need to pursue these conversations. Let me also inform you that PAASE uh, uh, will be conducting uh, related uh, conversations through chats uh, in the next few months. And uh, please be informed that uh, as a group, we submitted uh, nine proposals to DA for funding uh, on their priority projects uh, at the DA. So any other comments at this point? Maybe we call on uh, the PASI president, uh, Giselle, go ahead. Thank you, Eno. I think uh, this has been uh, one of the the best uh, uh, chats we've had in terms of uh, the depth of discussion. And um, before um, my uh, closing uh, remarks, I would like to recognize the presence of Dr. Basilio de las Reyes of uh, FAO and some PASA members uh, like uh, Joyce Ibana, whose uh, focus is on um, food and uh, livestock. She is trained as a microbiologist, um, but uh, she's now focused on um, food as a way uh, to um, promote health and wellness and, uh, well, prevent disease. And this runs right along uh, the ideas of academician Don Rasco, uh, where he's spearheading this program on food and nutrition and uh, diet and lifestyle change. Very challenging, but a lot of that can be done through information dissemination. Here we need to um, call on our PASE members um, and um, social scientists in particular. I would like to recognize the presence of our a professor from UP Diliman, former Dean of the College of uh, Social Sciences and Philosophy, Dr. Bernadette Abrera. And um, as uh, NS Javier has said, well, it's about culture. It's about agriculture, uh, understanding the culture of our farmers and fisher folk, but also understanding the culture of our markets, our uh, general population. Uh, that's now uh, dominated by uh, a very young age group. So there's multiple challenges that we face, but it looks like uh, with more conversations like this, very meaningful, very constructive, very collegial, I think we can all rally behind uh, NS Javier in trying to, um, uh, well, initiate revolutionary change um, in uh, food and agriculture to the point where he will no longer 
feel uh, contrition for our institutions. And um, very inspiring is uh, what um, Yusek Leo told us. I thought it was very insightful and his, um, his advice uh, is now based on experience, uh, not only in the Philippines, but also in Vietnam and other countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think that um, Ino and I will find a way to um, jot down some uh, next, uh, next to do things for move forward, to do uh, things to move forward. Simple things, but uh, actions that might help help our leaders in the food and agriculture industry. Thank you very much all for your attendance, for your inputs, and uh, for sharing this valuable time with us. Please um, be on the lookout for our next fireside chats. We're trying to uh, come up with a fireside chat on the pros and cons of ivermectin. Okay, this was uh, brought up yesterday at our fireside chat with uh, journalists and writers, uh, bridging them with COVID. And um, well, I'm I'm hoping that this will materialize on Wednesday, and my co-host there will be a former EOH secretary. Manolet Dairit. I hope you can join us then. Thank you very much, all. Good day, uh, good night. Okay, Goodbye. thank you very much, all participants. Magandang gabi, magandang hapon, at magandang umaga salamat. sa lahat. Thank you, Emil. Yeah, maraming salamat, Enes, Emil. Maraming salamat. Salamat po. Okay, salamat bye -bye. po. Hi, Joe. Thank you, Sir Ino. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ma'am Giselle. Stay safe, Stay safe and well, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Po. Thank you. Salamat. Cruz of very VCB. Available nung ano? Based on their effects, and we recommended the mechanical or manual removal followed by bioremediation. So again, science guiding, but whether it was uh, used or not, uh, I'm not really sure. So also, this one is still ongoing, planting on seagrass beds that... Okay, hindi tayo masyado nakafocus sa aqua and fisheries. Uh, that's another chat, you know, right? We'll, yeah, we'll organize with uh, the group. Maraming salamat, uh, Billy. And I think that uh, meron tayong uh, uh, pilot or showcase of how uh, technical uh, people, experts, and scientists can help you be open to um, our PASA and NAS members contributing to your, ano, to your endeavor, your work. Salamat well. po. Salamat okay. po. Okay. Okay. Salamat po. Okay. Salamat. Maraming salamat. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Maraming salamat. Thank you, Ma'am. Thank you very much. Maraming salamat. Joe. Kamusta na? <laughs> Keep safe. Okay. Sige. <laughs> Maraming salamat. Maraming salamat din.